Welcome to the Arts and Change Conference hosted by the University of Rochester's Institute for the Performing Arts in partnership with the Office of Equity and Inclusion, the Paul J. Burgett Intercultural Center, 540 West Main Inc., Create a Space Now, Eastman Institute for, the Mu for Music Leadership, the Warner School, and the Rochester Fringe Festival. My name is Rose Pasquarella Beauchamp, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm your conference host for this, ses this session with Dr. Danny Frankel and her colleagues. We would like to acknowledge with respect the Seneca Nation, known as the Great Hill People and Keepers of the Western Door of the Haudenosaunee. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers on whose ancestral lands the University of Rochester currently resides in Rochester, New York. As we come together, we want to honor the many lives tragically taken too soon in recent events by acknowledging the need for a commitment to constant action and attention surrounding the systemic issues that continue to impact each of us to this day. In order to en enable live transcription in your Zoom view, please click the arrow to the right of the live transcript box to view. That box can be dragged to another location on your screen. We are recording today's session, so please note your spoken, written comments and image may be, may be included as well as the transcript. In order to protect your privacy, we invite you to rename your Zoom profile with your first name only and your pronouns if you feel comfortable. Breakout rooms will not be recorded. Because we have back-to-back -back sessions scheduled, this session will end promptly at its end time. We encourage, we encourage presenters and or participants to share contact info via chat to foster continued discussion and connection where desired. This cluster will end with a 15 minute open discussion of all sessions. For our social media users, please use the hashtag of artschange22 if you feel inspired by something you hear or experience today. Thank you for joining us, and I'm now honored to welcome Dr. Danny Frankel and her colleagues uh, presenting The Inherent Healing of Dance When Eats East Meets West. Thank you very much, Rose. Uh, while I'm talking, I'm going to ask the other co-hosts to please pay attention to the admit pieces because it's been getting a little confusing for me. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm truly excited about giving this presentation because I'm going to be introducing you to five of the graduate students who are the first graduate students in dance movement therapy in India to be seeking a master's degree in what in India is being called expressive movement therapy. And as one of the co-creators of this program, uh, it's amazing to me actually that we're doing this so early in the development of the program. But that just goes to show you how invested the students are in the program. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, makes this program different is that we, unlike any of the other dance movement therapy programs around the world, start with living dance, living music, an approach that I developed with the hope of being able to find elements of dance that cut across all cultures that are not limited to one particular culture. And as a result, the students have been able to discover what it's like to work with unstylized movement, to discover what it's like to work, if you will, from the heart. Uh, we work from the premise that dance is inherently healing. And again, as I said, that uh, by working with basic elements of dance, such as breath, pulse, muscle connectivity, and shape, that uh, we have something to work with. Now, I want to clarify at the very beginning, shape is not the shape that we use in effort shape. Shape refers to the kinesthetic sense of the body boundary that, uh, based on practice-based evidence, suggests that it's related to, from a developmental pro pro uh, perspective and an aesthetic perspective, to uh, confidence, sense of autonomy, and that very aspect of charisma that sometimes makes you just focus on one person at a performance. And then, and I've been working on this cross-cultural thing for a while, but this class has started with something new. I added a component 
of looking at socioeconomic and political issues. And uh, all of that came from my seeking to learn more and more about Indian culture. And essentially what you will hear and see today are some of the outcomes of this really fresh approach to living dance, excuse me, to teaching living dance, living music, which I have been doing for a number of years, but it's very, very new. So the program is gonna come in four parts. First, I'm gonna give you some background as to how it developed and a really thumbnail, thumbnail description of living dance, living music, and the journey that brought me to where we are now, to where we are in integrating dance as an art that can foster change, both via therapy and as an artistic experience that is therapeutic. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, my favorite text of all that I found in reading Indian philosophers, Indian wisdom, all kinds of things uh, uh, by uh, Katarina and uh, Sudhir Kakar, which will give you, which is a book called The Indians, Portrait of a People, where we really got to see some of the issues that are important that color the culture, issues of patriarchy, hierarchy, the complexities of a female's role, the caste system, the whole issue of the other within the system of Indian culture. Part two is going to be uh, looking at the other, but not just the other within the systemic cultural other, but what's it like to be a foreigner in another country or even what's it like to feel like the other in the dance studio? Part three is going to present case studies, which the students have developed to highlight how they might use living dance, living music to deal with the kinds of issues that I just described to you. And we're also even, it's not only going to be people who are uh, being squashed by the culture, but also someone who's free thinking and looking at the culture in a different way. So you can get both aspects of how living dance can help. Um, and part four moves away from dance as therapy to dance as therapeutic, because we are very proud to have a number of dance professionals and choreographers, one of whom, as you know, who are our students, one of whom has been dealing with these issues of socioeconomic and uh, uh, psychological problems since as early as 2016 and has done her own choreography. So we're very excited. We're gonna share you some of, some of video of her work. Uh, so now very quickly, I wanna just tell you, you know, we talked about change. Uh, change is not easy. We all know that. And Dr. Nikita Mittal and I uh, really had to face that. In 2009, she came to Connections. And so for those of you who don't know, Connections is um, a, a freestanding institute that offers all the courses available to people who need to, want to become certified as dance movement therapists. It provides clinical services too, but we're focusing now really on education. Uh, from the start though, Nikki wanted to bring, that's short for Nikita, Nikki wanted to bring uh, our Western ways to India. She called it authentic dance movement therapy. Well, um, we did that. I, the faculty at Connections came over to India and we taught what we were teaching here in the States to uh, from a more Eurocentric perspective. Uh, and as I looked at what was happening during free time, I realized we were really missing out on something and that there was a whole culture beyond me that I had never experienced, whether it was from the food that students were bringing to me to eat during our communal eating time or to dancing during the free time when dancing was dancing classical dance steps. People uh, sharing moves from their choreography, things of that sort. So that was very different. And uh, it took us from 2009 to 2017 
after many starts and stops to get the program going. And the first program that evolved was a nine month program, uh, certificate program. I'm not gonna go into the whole spiel there because what I really wanna sh show you is that thanks to, I do want to show the respect and honor to Dr. Uh, K.H. Sanchetti, who is the founder of the Sanchetti Hus Orthopedic and Rehabilitative Hospital, uh, which houses the Sanchetti Healthcare Academy, which houses us along with the University of Pune. I'm not gonna go into the whole long name right now because I'm looking at the time and I'm like, woo, you got a lot of stuff to get in. And uh, uh, I really began to see that we had to take, look at this from another perspective. So the first thing I did was uh, notice the difference between the first, the first cohort and the second cohort. We had lots of older women in the first cohort. And suddenly starting the third cohort, we had all these younger women. And now with two programs, we only have four older women and we have all these wonderful younger women. And what do they do their free time? They don't dance the classical dances. They come into a circle and do Bollywood dances <laughs> or steps from Bollywood. So it's a very different group. And initially what I did was research and read all the, uh, as much as I could about Indian epics and the narratives that come in the classical dance and looked at embodying characters from them. But then I began to look more at Indian philosophy, philosophy and psychology written by Indians. And that's how I came upon the Kakars. So the Kakar book, the in Indians portrait of a people became a signed reading. So now these issues of autonomy, patriarchy, hierarchy, the struggle that women have in India became key elements in the course. Um, it was really right, remarkable when I started reading the assignments and one of them came from one of the older women. And in it, she explained that she realized she's been living in a bubble. The caste system never meant anything to her. And she began reading a lot and discovering how many people in India were suffering particularly the Dalits. The Dalits are the lowest caste, the most considered, the most impure. And she began reading, like discovering, oh my gosh, there's a whole piece of India that I've not been aware of. And neither was I. I mean, I knew about the caste system, but I didn't know how intense the caste system was. And uh, she created a case based on a reality of a Dalit woman who had been raped at age four, who experienced lots of violence in the way that many Dalit women did, and developed a case based on one particular woman who rose out of this violence to become a leader in the Dalit movement, particularly to bring women to the forefront. And in the process, she sent me lots of things, and I got lots of links and began to read that about affirmative action, that just like we have affirmative action, so do they in India. And the Dalits and lower caste people were getting opportunities to go to school that white people or, or higher caste people rather similarly complained about in some instances. And uh, but the Dalit situation wasn't easy. And even one of the Dalit student leaders who was really working to try to connect, couldn't take it anymore and committed suicide. So there are lots of caste created problems that occur in, in India. And so we were addressing them in class. So let me just see what I have left out that I wanted. Yes, so I wanted to let you that here in the United States, that caste system has followed. It has followed into the technology world, so much so that the Time Magazine recently had an interview of a very successful, um, either Facebook or Google uh, executive, someone very high in the scientific world. And his story was he grew up in poverty as a Dalit, and he worked really hard and his parents really supported his education. He lives with his family in a two, million dollar house in San Francisco and is afraid that he will be found out 
by the many Indians who have migrated here and would, for example, pat him on the back and realize, oh my goodness, he doesn't have the little thread that tell us he's from a higher caste. So this issue is a big issue. And so now I'm going to turn our situation over or our program over to someone who's going to talk about that very, very painful feeling of what it is like to be the other. Here is this man, $2 million house, and he is still feeling like the other. And so now I have to find, hold on a second, my, uh, <laughs> my uh, description of Krutika. Krutika. Oh, okay, here we are. Thank you. Everybody here are wonderful dancers, let me just tell you that. <laughs> uh, Krutika, she's an inherent art lover. She graduated in psychology and counseling. Krutika is currently a dance movement therapy, dance movement practitioner, and a mental health counselor by profession. Also having many years of experience in the performing arts, she has been trained under moder modern contemporary dance in the center of contemporary dance in Pune, and also been trained in belly dance in London. She believes in the body-mind-soul connection, and also that there is an artist hidden in each of us, and each one eventually finds it in their own paths and, and at their own pace. She's currently pursuing her master's in expressive movement therapy, that's our program, uh, here in Pune, and is looking to contribute and work to the field of therapy in India and globally integrating culture and arts together in a holistic approach. Kuta, I got to find you on the screen. There you are. Thank you, Danny, for the introduction. So let me get to the other. And as uh, Rituja, can you please put up the transcript? So Danny described about the other. So I have a lot of experiences regarding the other. So as you could see on the screen, as quoted by Kakar in the Indian's Portrait of a People, it says that there is a high value placed on connection is of most evident in the individual's relationship with others. This yearning for relationships, for the confirming presence of loved ones and the psychological oxygen they provide is the dominant modality of social relations in Indian culture. So basically, this is all about the Indian culture and how the social relationships are formed how there is a lot of connection and a lot of bond between uh, each of the family system, each of the social system and around in and out, outside the family. This connection does not mean that any Indian is incapable of functioning when they are by themselves or they lack a sense of agency or independency. What it implies is a greater need for ongoing mentorship, the guidance and help from others in getting through life and a greater vulnerability to feelings among relationships. So basically I had experience of the other in a foreign land, which I want to express. Uh, this uh, is back in the 2017, the pre-pandemic area where I had gone to London for pursuing a certain therapy course. I had some preparations about what the foreign land was and I had a certain mindset about the culture and the appropriation of it. But when I landed and I started my course, eventually, it became much deeper and much deeper. And it brought along a, you know, a normal homesickness feeling. But there was something more to it that I was just diagnosing and uh, trying to refer. So there was this connection, the warmth, the vulnerability to relationships that I was missing out in that foreign land. It seemed that there was much more of an individualistic living and a very cold and a very uh, lack of empathizing feeling for me. It would be certain that it took away my lack of agency and I felt a sense of disorientation and loneliness when I was there. From my highest high to my lowest low, I had experienced all of the, possi all of the possibilities that, that I could have been there. As an Indian, people had some prejudices that certainly weren't all true about me. It was just some cultural biases and preconceived notions that did not fade away with time. There was this bridge that was created unknowingly. 
but as much as, as i wanted to break it and cross to the other side it became more and more harder for me i was lost in becoming one of them and staying what i was an indian to heart this other that i was in the other land was something that i'd never experienced before but it taught me a lot perhaps it turned out to be my biggest learning in life and taking back today i would say i changed as a person changed as a human and i certainly believe that all cultures are different and we should we should try and mend all those cultures together in the sense of sharing connection and a greater empathetic empathetic sense now i say i changed for a i changed for a very good reason and i'm i'm taking all those memories as a learning and as a process that i could inherit and share with each other so uh, this was all about the uk experience i wanted to share about and this was one polar opposite of what the other seemed to me as a person so it's not necessary that you know everyone has that feeling is just as me as a person what i felt through but at the same time i also experienced the other as you you might say the more positive side of what the other is in a certain second experience i would like to share so getting to my second opposite experience this culturally particularly applied my sense of the other when i was working with a group recently where my co facilitator knew the group from before and i was entering as the new person in the group as the second co facilitator there was a sense of vulnerability need of acceptance for me at the very beginning as a reason the lack of agency was there at the present but it slowly and gradually with guidance and ongoing mentorship that helped me through the process there was a transformation that took uh as you could say that the creative process can flow through and dissolve the barriers and biases of differences that are significantly felt between me as the other and in the inherent context of art and therapy so all that enveloped by movement and stillness sound and silences we flow through the arts to find out our most authentic energy at the center of our inner spaces and we felt more alive and the whole it just flowed organically and felt that the balance was restored and had that sense of agency in me creativity is a magical tool which can dissolve any barriers and i feel that can make a process as beautiful and authentic as it can it makes or breaks a process and in here it can be applied to even cultural aspects from the east to the west the inherent healing of nature of dance is such that it could be the other which brings together the east and the west and dissolve in the mere borders of culture and build connection yes so i if danny wants to share something about this i would like to see we can hear you right now danny but on mute danny I should know better. Uh, uh, we're talking about now how creativity can actually dissolve some boundaries, and that the reality is we have to pay attention to in the dance studio as well. That we can feel like the other, a student may feel like the other, but the beautiful thing about dance is that somehow it can dissolve uh, the boundaries. So now, what I'd like to do is just transition over to part three of our. a uh, presentation where you will be introduced to three students uh who uh have been working as all the students have been working very hard on trying to understand what it is like when human beings who are living within a very ancient culture are dealing with long long term issues such as the caste system such as the role and of women and the complexity of women during this transition phase where we're moving from women in the kitchen to women in the professional world and what it's like to have one foot in the kitchen and one foot in the professional world but that it's not only limited to women that men are also facing this change themselves so first i'm going to introduce prajakta prajakta 
is a graduate in dance and has a master's degree in cytogenetics. Let me tell you about the brilliance of these women. So many of them are have degrees in engineering, in biology, in medicine. It's quite remarkable. And she has her degree in psychogenetics from the University of Mumbai and has been teaching Kathak, one of the most classical dances that's very, has a lot of narrative and a lot of the stories. So if I ever want to know about a particular character or a particular goddess, I just turn to Prajakta. She has it all, the science and the classical art. And she's been teaching that in Mumbai for the last 17 years. Prajakta? Uh, and do you want me to introduce Rutija first? I don't remember. Do it now or after? Now, uh, following Rut following Rutija, we're going. To, excuse me. Following Prajata, uh, Rutija, Doctor Rutija, let me add, uh, is going to be uh, talking uh, about how hierarchy, which is very instilled in Indian culture, can affect men, and she like. Rutaja is going to explain how living dance can affect change. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Rutaja. Sorry about that, Rutaja. Uh, Rutaja, Dr. Rutaja is a homeopathic doctor and believes in body mind integrity and how one affects the other and vice versa. She believes in holistic approach and intends on combining her knowledge of homeopathy and dance movement therapy for the improvement of her patients, both physically and mentally. So I introduce you now to Dr. to Prajakta and Dr. Rutuja. Thank you, Danny, for the wonderful introduction. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, this wonderful system of joint family in India. Now, joint family means that three or sometimes even four generations. Uh, live together under one roof. So you'll have the, uh, the grandfather, the, the father and the son and his kids living together under one roof. And all this family with their wives and their kids create a kind of an ecosystem. And what happens is that um, we would uh, assume that the roles are, uh, the work is designated and divided equally, but that does not quite happen. What happens is that the men are supposed to go out and earn and the women are supposed to cook and nurture. So what happens is that when a meal is being cooked, the men and the kids in the family will be fed first and the women will wait until they are done, until their stomachs are full, to sit after them to have their meal. By the time the, the meal has gotten cold and probably unpalatable and then they'll sit. Now, if we go to slightly urban cities wherein there are um, nuclear families, wherein it will be a husband, wife, and a kid, or husband, wife, and two kids maximum, which is a typical urban Indian setup, then the uh, conditions kind of worsen because there are lesser number of female helping hands in the family. So what happens is that this educated working woman comes back from her corporate or government job and when she comes back in the evening, she has to rush to the kitchen to cook a piping hot meal for her family, for her husband and for her kid, while the husband has the liberty to lounge himself on the sofa, surfing the channels and relaxing after a hard day's work. So uh, uh, after she serves her, the, the kids and the husband their meal, she then sits probably alone on the dining table to have the meal by herself. This does not end there. After that, she has to rush to the kitchen to clean up the kitchen, close it. And she can call it a day only if she spared the task of taking the homework or studies of her children before she can retire for it. So with these daunting tasks, it's a never ending thing for this woman who has lost herself sometimes and does not even at times have the empowerment to delegate the work or to have a maid for herself and assert herself. So um, with this, I will um, pass the baton to Rutuja to tell us about what is happening with the men in Indian society. Rutuja, over to you. Uh, 
thank you so much, Prajakta. Uh, so, uh, Prajakta gave us a, a beautiful narration of joint family and how women, uh, you know, do the work alone. Uh, continuing to what she said, uh, in Indian societies, when a male is born, when a male child is born, it's celebrated. And if a female child is born, it's considered as a burden. Now, I'll tell you the real reason why uh, celebration is there when a male child is born. That is because as soon as the male child is born, uh, the family is very happy because finally there is somebody to look after them once they grow old. There is finally somebody to take on the responsibilities of the whole family to continue the family business. So the son, since he's small, looks up to his father and then his mind is conditioned that he has to grow up, get a good job, have a proper salary, work for his family, earn the bread and butter and uh, take care of his parents after they grow old. So this is what a male's mind has been conditioned to do. Now, eventually, when uh, we see that a male is not doing all those things, what if he wants to sit home and take care of the kids? What if uh, he wants to be there for his family and spend time with his kids rather than, you know, uh, going for a nine to five job and not even sparing his weekends? Uh, he misses those important moments uh, that is when his child is growing up because he's so busy in work and the mother has to take care of the child. You know, all these things are what pens uh, up. All these things are what uh, are suppressed. And uh, when a man decides, if a man will decide that he wants to stay home and rather the wife has to work, he'll look after the kids, he'll cook food for them. You know, the gender roles are reversed. Uh, the same Indian society will shame them shame him for doing so because uh, that is not a man's job that is a women's job and uh, eventually uh, if uh, eventually you know he's not able to do what he wants to he's not able to live the way he wants to uh, he's not able to cry and let out those emotions those feelings because men are not supposed to cry that is what they are taught since the beginning and uh, if you cry then how are you the backbone of the family uh, eventually all these emotions, all these feelings get pent up. This uh, huge responsibility is on their shoulders and uh, they are not able to express it to anybody and they just keep on working for years and years and uh, eventually when a lot of feelings are suppressed, it will lead to physical as well as mental health problems. Uh, when there's no outlet, it will lead to uh, physical symptoms, various illnesses, diseases, um, anxieties, mania, depression. We will see a lot of such cases that due to suppression, uh, the man has to bear. So, uh, given the battle to Prajakta, I would like her to continue. So, thank you, Rutuja. Um, with this kind of pressure um, at on, on the women and the men in India, uh, We've had, we, we now have the wonderful concept and the principle of living dance, living music. And one of the principles of living dance, living music, it's, it's shape, which fosters boundaries and which makes sure that an individual can set boundaries very, very well by being calm, composed and assertive without losing the temper while someone is confronting the other or explaining why he or she needs to uh, place himself or herself first. Because it's not just that happy mothers create happy kids, but I think happy families create happy kids, uh, which is the future of our society. So um, once, if the uh, woman of the family can practice shape, what she can do is that she can foster boundaries as well as explain why she needs her me time. Why she needs delegation of work? Why are the roles uh, which are going to be considered as equal are going to be the future of Indian society? This is very important and this is what shape will do to her. Then another concept of home and first home is going to help her to center herself and calm herself at the end of the day. Because with the hustle bustle and multiple tabs opening in her mind, and the multitasking that she is doing with the work and life, she kind of loses the work-life balance. 
so in order to get back and get get centered in order to think properly home is going to uh, be very useful and home is a, a principle of living dance living music which also uses breath uh, to connect with the home now breath is a very very important aspect of indian culture because yoga pranayam kriya breath work meditation are the essence of what we are taught right from the childhood so breath is not something new to us and use of breath and the connection of it with home is going to make a very personal connection to all the indian women out there so that they can devote that time to themselves uh, probably spare some time she could uh, go for a walk and walk with the breath and connect to her breath at the end of the day spare some time to do some deep breathing some yoga uh, some uh, meditation some pranayam and while doing this uh, she can also use home and shape as one of the key elements of finding herself finding her voice and very calmly assert and tell the others and the family members that no i need my time and while doing this a lot many eyebrows are going to be raised a lot many questions and probably sarcastic comments are going to be uh, you know uh, confronted on her but i think with home and her shape in place she can handle it very very effectively so uh, this is my uh, uh, concept of shape and home for uh, indian women uh, i will uh, now ask rutuja to uh, explain about how these concepts can be used for men in our society as prajakta said that uh, shape is something that will help uh, the women form boundary around herself uh, i think i'll use it for males as well because uh, speaking up doing something for yourself keeping themselves first as well shape will uh, help and do that as well now uh, prajakta mentioned that finding form that is connecting with your breath is going to help the female attain peace that calmness so that she can have a good night sleep but uh i consider home as a place of suffering as well because uh when you find home uh you understand your emotions you understand your feelings those buried emotions come up those buried feelings come up you have to face those feelings and that is why home is also a place of suffering and if we work with home for the men um it can eventually lead to a lot of uh, feeling of overwhelm he might not understand uh you know how do i handle all those feelings because they have been buried since many years and eventually this is a time where shape will help uh because shape uh, creates boundaries and acts as a container for these feelings and emotions therefore uh while working with uh any male i will always start with uh, oh, uh shape first and then move on to home because then shape will act as a container for these feelings thank you so much uh i would like to ask dani okay thank you <laughs> very much thank you very much dr rutuja and uh prajakta uh for those of you who came in later let me just explain two definitions home is uh the place where when you you find on your body or even on your head that's what you, um what project I was talking talking about in first home but home is the place where you can experience your breath both on the inhalation and the exhalation and it's a way of using touch movement breath and energy or focused attention to really feel the inhalation and the exhalation because the reality is and they're in the different chakras but the reality is all of them are not always open at the same time and so that home can actually open the 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 tears or the feelings to suffering so you can have home that's peaceful or you can have home that speaks to a place of suffering so that's one piece and for those of you who all came in late shape is not the shape of effort shape shape is the kinesthetic sense of the body boundary it's a different uh way we have two different kinds of shapes 2d shape and 3d shape what prajakta and dr rutaja have both been talking about are 2d shape so with that i want to now 
uh, check with Rutaja. Are you about finished? Ready for the the video? Yeah, okay. Um, I want to introduce you to Sumana. Sumana is a student in the program who is unable to be here because she's being a great mom and at a performance that her child is having at this very moment. Sumana likes to call herself a free thinking person, always in the making, a human being free thinking and always in the making. She began to train and dance only recently, but she believes she is a dancer by nature. And I can tell you that's the case. Um, uh, uh, she's a dancer by nature because for her to move is to live. Self-help and therapy have been her natural calling ever since she became a mother. The process of strengthening the self in order to make a positive impact on others began with her journey in Waldorf education. Mind you, she's also a degree in engineering, just to let you know. Uh, she now pursues her master's degree in expressive movement therapy, the basis of which is body, mind, integrity that addresses the whole human being. Uh, okay, Rutaja, let's see how we do this. <laughs> We're learning how to be technicians. I want to begin with thanking Danny for this opportunity to share my story and my views here with this audience. Thank you, Danny. And thank you, Kritika, for bringing up the topic of the other. I'm sure everyone has felt like the other at some point in their lives. I was one of the co-facilitators for the group of adolescent girls that Kritika mentioned. And I have personally known these girls for many years. I bear witness to Pratika's anxiousness that came from being the other and also the wonderful dissolution of this feeling as we all entered the creative process together. I myself feel like the other time and again among people simply because we think differently or hold different values. For example, I relate to what Prajakta has said as one part of reality. I have grown up watching my mother transform these norms of gender roles in our household. So when I see my in-laws rather conservative in these matters and living exactly as Prajakta has described, I feel I probably come out as rather nonchalant as the other living by my own personal values. I represent an urban Indian whose previous generation went through with higher education traveled many countries, voluntarily gave up many ritualistic practices and accepted a more global worldview. I grew up in a household that had clearly risen from, the, from poverty to the good life with an open mind about how one must live their life. Clearly see the respectful conflict avoiding means that were adopted to turn away away from rituals that no longer made sense to that generation. Clearly an example of having shape. I see this generational change as part of the rise of individualism, which even the Kakars mention in their book. In this sense, I wasn't succumbed to any religious norms and probably even missed out on some of the richness of it that can be absorbed in the early ages. No one ever spoke to me or taught me any God. Whatever I learned about God was through observing some of the remnant rituals of lighting the lamp in front of statues of different gods and chanting slokas. Today, I call myself a free thinking individual, always in the making, who learns these slokas and their interpretations by choice or reads translations and interpretations of Indian books of wisdom only because it intrigues me and even unravels its wonderful deep philosophy that I now align with. I pick and choose my rituals as and when I awaken to their plausible benefits. While I see patriarchy as much a global phenomenon as Indian and hierarchy as a very strong phenomenon in the South and Southeast Asian lands, I believe that I have been exposed to very mild, modernized versions of these phenomena. 
I do not represent the Indian that suffers from these phenomena and sometimes brutally in their daily life. I remember my father telling me this. I was a male chauvinist until the day I had two daughters. I grew up watching my parents constantly question cultural and religious norms in healthy household discussions and put in place family values that stemmed from free thinking. I even began my adult life with a job in a space company that further strengthened my individualist free thinking self. So when I read Tucker's The Indians Portrait of a People, I wonder how liberated and even privileged I've been. All that the book stirred up in me were a handful of memories that involved microaggression through patriarchy and hierarchy. None of which I cannot handle today without compromising my own personal values. When I am connected to my breath and when I have my shape, I also automatically find the empathy that I need to connect to the other. Ignorance is bliss. The state must have some truth to it as blissful are those who live within a strong set of beliefs, be it belief in patriarchy or hierarchy as a norm. Conflict lies from those who are awakening to aspects of these norms that no longer serve the individual or community. And where there are conflicts, there is scope for change, transformation and new thinking. This, I believe, is the living dance of the people of this world, constantly churning and transforming. I do believe that the living dance concepts of breath, pulse, muscle connectivity and shape are some of the fundamental elements of life and living that can serve the individual at their level of readiness and awakening and gradually aid transformation in the least controversial manner. Danny, I know, yeah. sorry, I was all prepared to unmute myself and then uh, um, we'll take Q&A questions after everybody's done, okay? Um, uh, but I, Sumana, I believe, mentioned microaggressions at one point and that was something that was very concerning to me. And uh, I often ask the students when I said things, did I step on your feet? Is it okay what I said? constantly over and over again and Sumana and Krutika and I discussed it and how is it that every, nobody complained everybody said no it's fine it's fine it's fine and Sumana and Krutika said well maybe some of the devout women don't like what you're saying so I did check in with them and that was not the case and finally one day one woman said to me Danny would you stop asking us these questions we know where you're coming from. We're learning together and you're constantly saying, you're say, you know, you learn from us the way, you know, we learn from one another. So, uh, but it really was an issue for me. I was walking on eggshells sometime and taking risks that I wondered if I should. Now, courage is a very big thing in India and it takes courage to, for which courage is for me on my part, I thought, to, to ask the class all the time because I didn't know what to expect. But it also takes courage to speak your mind through dance and, uh, and to own it publicly as a choreographer, as a performer. So I am so excited to share with you um, videos, some one made by a, a very professional working artist but first, I'd like to introduce you to someone who is a student in our class and a daring choreographer. Janvi, I thought her name was John Javi, as the same as you, Rose, but it's Janvi. <laughs> Janvi is an independent contemporary dance artist and dance educator based out of Pune, now also an aspiring dance movement therapist. Her body of work consists of interdisciplinary works inspired by the stories around her that are unheard of. Her major works so far consist of body agency and women-centric 
issues. John V, the stage is yours. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thank you for the wonderful work. And uh, first of all, thank you for having all of us here uh, and given, giving us an opportunity to share our thoughts and our experiences. Since this conference is about change and art, uh, as a student of art, I say uh, student because I think that I am going to be a lifelong learner of art. There's no end to it. The change for me is inevitable and the very nature of our existence. As an artist, I have been taught and groomed to believe in this code of living. How to respond to change within me and around me is something that I have been witnessing through my personal practice, as well as by witnessing the practice of my fellow artists in the city, as well as some senior artists in, in the country. One of such performances which has moved me and has encouraged me is called Yoni. Yoni it literally translates into womb. W O M B. This piece is performed and created by Dr. Janaki Rangarajan, who is a Bharatanatyam dancer. We will be witnessing a small part of this performance shortly, but before that, I would like to give you all a brief about the same. In her piece, she says, I am nature, I bleed to create. I had been hidden away. I had to avoid my eyes and feel shame and guilt. We sat on moss to soothe our organs. We even used dirty cloth to soak our wombs offerings. And today, we wrap our sanitary napkins in thick black plastic covers. Precisely, the Bharatanatyam dancer is speaking about and questioning the idea of impurity associated with menstruation in India. In India, we are shamed for being on our menstruation cycle, which is beyond imagination. We are not allowed in temples during those four days. We suddenly become untouchable. The households in, that, uh, in the progressive uh, uh, areas of the country no more believe in these ideas, but not allowing women in temples or even during household sacred rituals is still a strong act throughout India. The irony of these cultural constructs is that, that in one part of the country, we have a temple of a bleeding goddess, the goddess of the womb. But in the other parts of the country, a lot of shame is associated with the idea of menstruating women entering the temples. In her whole performance, Dr. Janaki Rangarajan has spoken about this goddess and has reimagined as a woman of today's time. I would request Shrutuja to please play the video so that we all can uh, witness what the dancer has to say. and I bleed to create but I had to be hidden away I had to avert my eyes and feel shame and guilt <laughs> Today, 
we wrap our sanitary napkins in thick black plastic covers and buy them with bated breath privilege not and engage in rites and rituals and mantras and prayers to purify themselves <laughs> but for you periods are your rites of purification your sanitary napkin is your cauldron of purification be a goddess deliberate in your divinity <laughs> Taking inspiration from artists uh, such as Dr. Janaki Rangarajan, as a performing, performing artist myself, I have felt a strong need to look at arts, especially dance, as a way more than entertainment from the very beginning of my career. Dance being a way to communicate and create gentle yet long lasting impact on the mind to the body is something that I have been keen on working on as a performer, teacher, and now an aspiring dance movement therapist. A large part of my work as an independent contemporary dance artist in India has gone into speaking about body agency through performance, practice, and teaching. I have seen the body not merely as a pool of functioning in the society, but as a medium to speak about things that matter as human. We will now see another piece, which is on the similar lines as Dr. Janaki Rangarajan, but with adolescent, girl, adolescent girls of the school where I taught dance. These girls, whom I met during uh, a period of two years, come from different parts of the country and they belong to different social economic backgrounds, but they face a similar issue and similar experiences when they first started their menstrual cycle. In this piece, these four girls are sharing their experience about how they were treated by their families uh, when they first told them that, oh, I've got my period, I think. They were put in one room for 10 days and were not allowed to come out. Through the movement practice during the classes, they found a way to speak about this. They put their hands up and said that I want to say that I am under arrest. That's how I felt. So this is how they found the movement metaphors or symbolisms uh, during creating this whole dance. Another very strong uh, movement that came to them was holding the umbilical cord and going back to the womb of their mother where they felt safe again safe from the outside world safe from the eyes of the society safe from everything that was stopping them from being themselves i would request rutuja again to put on the video of sacred blood which is created by the girls from the school called Avasara Academy in Pune. Arvi, the previous video that I played was right. I'll share it the same way. Yes. Mid by Paripotas. A mental tennis, in Paripotas. 
सड़न का कल तेरे सुसार की ना रूम कंप्लीट कर रेड तोटी फिल आई ना छाला पे मिस हुई थी नंते इल्ल चूसा चूसी ते इनका नहीं चांदो नहीं बुन गुत्तू ना नानी तारवा तार तमें दी आदि ब्लर तारवा ते इल्ल चूसते आदि मुंडी Thank you, Rukuja. They are speaking in four different languages because we wanted to bring in the idea that even if you are in any part of the country, the treatment is the same. the The notion of menstrual menstrual cycle and impurity is the same. That's why they are speaking in their native languages from where they belong. Thank you. You can see why I am so proud of these young women and so excited to have taken the risk of integrating a course in living dance, living music with the reality of the kinds of socioeconomic, psychological and uh, cultural issues that run through what Sudhir Kakar calls the cultural unconscious of India. That's in contrast to Freud with the personal unconscious, Jung with the collective unconscious, and now we have the cultural unconscious. So to summarize, we have tried to share in what seems like a really short time, what it's like to integrate ideas from the East and the West and to bring in issues into a dance movement therapy class, such as patriarchy, hierarchy, and the caste system into the first master's program in dance movement therapy. It was quite a risk, and you can see it was a risk worth taking. So we have really timed it well, and uh, we are open to uh, questions, and uh, we'd like to hear from you. And uh, I, I, I'm just in Yiddish, you know, you guys, I, 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 uh, I'm quelling is what it means is that I feel really proud of what the students have shared and thrilled that the risk that I took to bring in some subject subjects that remain uh, so challenging in India that people don't want to talk about them to the forefront in a class and in the very first class. So questions, and we're happy to take them. Yes, Anne. Such amazing and important work you all are doing. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious at the times where it seems like you're in a performance setting and not in the classroom. Have you had the opportunity for people to respond to you after seeing these works? Um, 
I'm particularly interested in the young girls um, feedback that they may have heard as well as then the um, mature women. Uh, so uh, this performance was done as a part of uh, something called as a Vox platform in the school that they study in. Vox, I think, translates into voice. Uh, so something that gives these girls a voice to speak about things that they usually can't speak at home. And uh, I remember what happened after the performance was uh, girls the other girls in their uh, school they came to watch the performance along with the teachers and uh, i remember some of them had tears in their eyes some of them uh, got inspired to tell their own story and uh, they came up to us and said that we want to join this class because uh, we get to speak what we want to speak and uh, the teachers in the school uh, also encouraged uh, these activities where uh, even the, the women teachers in the school uh, said that even we would like to uh, be a part of this because uh, there are issues that even we face. And uh, you can see that these issues are being uh, faced by, by women in India to a very young age, like as soon as a woman is born, like uh, Rutuja said and Sajitra said, uh, we have a list of responsibilities that we are being given instantly that this is how you have to be. And women want to break free. And these girls these days are rebellious in nature and that gave them courage, like dance gave them courage to uh, just go and be themselves. It's it's so beautiful, so beautiful. I um, were any parents ever present? No. But uh, this, on the YouTube, uh, so we put this video on YouTube, and the parents can watch uh, these performances whenever they can. Uh, but we haven't heard anything uh, from the parents because uh, the school is a residential school mostly, so uh, the girls stay in the school and uh, do all the work because a lot of girls also come from underprivileged background where they don't have a safe home to go back to. So yeah, so that's how, that's how the program works. And, and, and also there is a real difference between often what's happening in rural areas and areas that haven't been exposed to culture in the way that uh, those who live in urban settings are exposed. So um, there's still a lot of learning to go on, but those questions are wonderful questions. And it's an example of how we have dance movement therapy, living dance, living music provides basic elements of dance, again, that cut across all cultures that can be used then as sources of improvisation and expression. And I don't want to say, by the way, that Western views are not considered in this in in the master's program because there are wonderful elements in Western views and, for example, uh, uh, the concept of kinesthetic empathy. It's really the cornerstone of dance movement therapy, but it also helps both in the clinical setting and in the educational setting when you're able to engage in a concept like kinesthetic empathy and even the idea of improvisation is something that is coming from the West because classical dance has been, you know, very precise. You have to go through lots of levels of education. You have to pass lots of tests. You have to do it the correct way. So it is a beautiful blend of the East and the West. Any other questions? Oh, come on, you must have some questions. Be curious about things. Well, then, if that's not the case, I'm going to share something that I left out of my part of the presentation. And that was a major struggle that I had. How to integrate the great classics, the epics, the narratives 
that are almost like the substratum of Indian culture that everybody knows, and you guys help me with the pronunciation if I get it wrong, two great epics that were written in Sanskrit, Ramayana, 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 and not good, and Mahabharata. And in those, there are characters, two women who represent beautiful goddesses, but also represent different images of how the Indian woman is portrayed. And initially, that was my entree into working and bringing and integrating the cultures. And it took me time to go beyond the classics. For example, again, help me if I got this right. Oh, because I don't have my notes in front of me. Natya Sastra, did I get it right? Ah, good. Natya Sastra, the ancient texts of dance and how to a perform and the difference between learning how to dance to make the audience feel and dealing in dance therapy to get the client to feel. And uh, that was a big challenge for me uh, because again, I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. I wanted to be really careful. Uh, but then I began to expand my reading. I was reading philosophy and psychology by Indians. And that's how I came upon the great number of writings by Sudhir Kakar. And uh, if you really want to learn something about another culture, look up his writings because he really has come up with a wonderful concept of the cultural unconscious in contrast to the Western view of the in personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. And he, by the way, studied in the East. I mean, in the West, sorry. He studied in the West. And so he's very familiar with both approaches to healing and introspection. Any other questions? Oh, come on. Oh, Bev, good. Hello. Bev, I'm so glad you have a question. Yeah, I have a question. So, um, the, the Indian dance is beautiful, so I love them. Um, I'm, I'm very, very curious. Um, so after these girls, uh, our Indian women learning the therapy dance, so how these therapy dance change their practical lives, such as the relationship with, um, with other people in the real life? Um, all such as the position um, in their social life. So I really curious about how the dance therapy um, will change their uh, positions or change the, or improve their um, practical lives. So well, I can tell you in a nutshell. One of the women in one of the nine month certificate programs said, and in writing and then choreographed a dance about it, said, learning about shape saved my life. I found myself. Until then, I was everybody else's person. So that's the best that I can tell you in a nutshell. Uh, it does it in small ways. People learn how to take risks. People learn how to speak from their own truth. And to do that in a culture where you're expected to behave, that's a real challenge. So uh, I don't know where you're from, but uh, uh, I also oh, I'm from China. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I also teach in China, and that's an issue that we pay attention to a lot mm -hmm. in the dance therapy training. Uh, yeah. Bev had her hand raised, so I wanted to get to hear from Bev. And just a heads up, we have one minute left. OK. okay. I didn't have a question as much as just wanted to thank all the presenters for sharing their personal stories and your preparation. Um, as a student of Living Dance with Dr. Danny, it's just wonderful to see how the work is expanding and how you've made this your own in your own context. Um, it's, it's just really inspiring. So thank you all very much. Wow. Thank you very much, and I think that's a beautiful way for us to end our presentation. <laughs>